The Lord be with you. And also with you. Happy Daylight Savings Time. It's nice to see you. A um, couple of things in our prayers today. You are going to hear uh, two prayers for sympathy. One is for the family and friends of Gerald Brown. His funeral will be Tuesday at 11. The other is for the family and friends of Dorothy Lokensgaard, who died uh, yesterday, at, yesterday morning at 10.30. We do not know yet when services for Dorothy will be. Our gospel lesson today is the story of Jesus turning the tables of the money changers. We'll see what that means for us. I think, oh, don't forget Wednesday, midweek Lenten worship services, uh, Wednesday noon and 7 p.m. I think that's it. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day and brought us safely to this beautiful sanctuary where we can praise you. Let us never be caught in your sanctuary. 
selling our wares, becoming money changers. Let us not do that in your kingdom. Lead us always in the way of righteousness. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise and sing.
our sin in the presence of God and one another. Dear Heavenly Father, we watch with dismay as we continually miss the mark, leaving us in a desolate place. Be with us today and always. Lead us out of the desert of trials and arid temptations. Walk with us to the oasis where the waters of forgiveness refresh. Let us see the beauty of your kingdom and dismiss the mirages of this world. These things we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The good news is that God and Christ does care about us. And for the sake of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, Almighty God, forgives us all our sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel of St. John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you. You may be seated. I had a puppet sermon with overturned tables and everything, but uh, my puppeteer needed to go to St. Louis, and I said, I'm going to give you a break. You may go. So, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Say, I'm going to show you a piece of artwork today. Maybe. There you go. We're going to have it. This is, I'm going to show you three areas. This is Jesus. Uh, with a, his whip, and if you look at that whip, it looks about the size of a necklace. Hardly any grown man would be afraid of that, but uh, nonetheless, this is a picture, a painting, a fresco on the wall of uh, Chauvin uh, Chapel in Italy. The Chauvin family, ironically, were bankers. Uh, Reginaldo Chauvin was such a notorious banker, he, he charged usurious interest, and he was scandalized throughout the country. In fact, Dante, in the seventh level of hell, has Chauvin in the seventh level of hell to show you how despised this family was. Well, they made so much money, his son built the Chauvin uh, Chapel and had uh, Giatti, a painter by the name of Giatti, paint this painting. Uh, and it's entitled, The Expulsion of the Merchants. Isn't I, that ironic? A, that, that a um, person, an unscrupulous banker, would have this painting made. So you see Jesus there. And in the 13th, 1300s, the interesting... Well, you got ahead of me, but that, that's all right. Jesus in the whip, the, with the whip. In the 1300s, they haven't yet gotten the idea of how to make depth, depth right in the paintings. 
Uh, that really didn't happen until the Renaissance. So that's why these paintings all look sort of wooden. Over on the one side, the right-hand side, you s see the um, scribes and elders talking about Jesus, what is he doing? And then over on the left side, we see the disciples. And the, you know they're disciples because they all have halos. But in the Gospels, the disciples are the ones that didn't think children were of very much value. And what are they doing in this picture? They're shielding the children. It's like they're going, uh-oh, Jesus is acting up, children. Close your eyes. <laughs> it's sort of like parents fighting, and one of them says, shh, not in front of the kids, right? And I showed you this picture for two reasons. One, I like to look at this stuff. <laughs> the second one is, if you are going to make a picture of Jesus turning over the tables, what would your picture look like? In a sense, that is exactly what John has given us, a picture. Uh, John is very different than the synoptic writers in that he shows these things happening at different times. That this happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Everyone else showed, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, showed it happening the last week, at the beginning of the last week of Jesus' ministry. So this is John's witness to us. He's constructing it in a way that he feels will get across his point. Before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about anger. Jesus was angry. We don't know how many other times he was angry, but he was certainly angry here. It made me think a little bit because uh, today they're having a big commemorative day for uh, the um, uh, march across the bridge in Selma. And I made me wonder, what would Jesus, if Jesus were alive in the 60s, what would he have done? Would he have been angry about that? Then I remembered the story of Stokely Carmichael. Back in the 60s, you didn't have a very positive picture of Stokely Carmichael, a radical black. And we know now why he was radicalized. He tells the story of being just a guy. And they desegregated schools in the town that he lived in. So he brought his six-year-old niece to school. And when they got to the sidewalk, they were met by the police. And he said that he was pushed away in a six-year-old daughter, excuse me, his six-year-old niece, six years old, was thrown to the ground. A police officer put his heel on her neck and a gun, the barrel of the gun, he put in her ear. And he said, you will never go to school with any white boys. Don't ever show your face here again. And Stokely Carmichael went home, shocked, his niece in tears, sobbing. And then he vowed, I'll never let a policeman do that to any black man again. Now, I don't care what you think about Stokely Carmichael. I think I'd be angry too if it happened to my niece. Uh, in fact, if you don't get angry, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Jesus got angry. And we're told why he was angry. Um, here's John's witness. He has this happen at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Why 
in a sense, he is explaining to us what happened that ha just before this. Jesus changed water into wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And we all scratch our heads. Why did he do that? Ceremonial, ceremonial wa uh, water that's used for washing and, and Jewish purification is now turned into fantastic wine. Something new is happening. The old is passing away. Something new is happening. We find out what that new, uh, a little bit more about that new because he goes to the temple in Jerusalem. 300,000 Jews, they estimate, filled that town, extra Jews, on their pilgrimage to come to Jerusalem for Passover. And he goes to the temple and he sees this marketplace taking place inside the walls of the temple. He gets upset. Now, they didn't have this marketplace there. Usually, what was happening, they had some interesting worship wars happening at that time. According to the historian Josephus, Josephus said that the high priest Caiaphas was having a dispute with the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, of course, that is the, the major uh, group that determined laws for the uh, Jewish people, uh, made decisions. And Caiaphas kicked them out of the temple. They couldn't have their offices in the temple anymore. So, uh, because uh, this marketplace was noisy and smelly, the Sanhedrin moved it up close to the temple. And not to be outdone, Caiaphas says, well, why don't you come inside the temple as long as they give me a, a cut? So it was a very lucrative thing to do. The temple made a lot of money. But as a consequence, this outer courtyard area of the temple, inside the fence, but uh, outer courtyard area, it's where women went to worship. It's where the Gentiles went to worship. It's where people gathered and talked before they went into the temple proper. Jesus looks at it. Uh, of course, what did they need animals for? Uh, these pilgrims would come and they'd buy a fresh unblemished animal so they wouldn't have to travel with their own animal and uh, use it for the sacrifices at the temple. Everyone who entered the temple gates had to pay a coin. The coin could not be a Roman coin. It had to be one issued by the temple that didn't have any uh, pagan inscriptions, any inscription of the emperor. So they, they needed, in order for, for the temple practices to happen, the sacrifices, everyday commerce within the temple, in order to have that happen, they needed money changers. They needed the uh, people selling the animals. Well, Jesus looks at it and he goes, they've desecrated my father's house. They've made it a marketplace. By the way, that's different than the gospel, uh, the, the other gospel, the synoptic gospel writers, where they said, you've made it into a den of robbers. Jesus said, you've just made it into a marketplace. Takes his whip, gets angry, takes his whip, and drives away the animals and turns over the money pots. Gets them out of there. Well, chief priests, the elders, the scribes, they go to Jesus and say, tell us by what authority you are doing this. And Jesus said, tear down this temple 
then three days I will raise it up again. And they're shocked. It took 46 years to build this temple. It sounds like a long time. How many years did it take to build the Washington Cathedral? Let's say that's a recent building. 30 years. 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it up in three days? And of course, the disciples then go, oh, he's talking about his body. So what was Jesus saying? Out with the old. Now, the presence of God is not found merely by going to the old temple and doing animal sacrifices. Now the presence of God is found in the new temple, Jesus Christ, his body. By the way, the New Testament, Paul in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, it's also mentioned in 1 Peter. We are that body. So where is the presence of God to be found? Among his people, among us. Jesus is saying that he's the place where the presence of God dwells among his people. Where God's presence dwells among us. I didn't share this uh, story with the early service. So you're getting an exclusive here, a bonus. How does this happen? You know, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes how it seems God, yeah, there's so many God moments that happen. And one of those God moments happened uh, a week ago. Uh, it might be a couple weeks ago now. Uh, I try to um, get to the veterans' home up in Mount Vernon, um, see a couple of people. Uh, Jim Morak is one of those. And uh, I take with me lately Carl Westland. Carl is a new member to the congregation, but he had been going to see a gentleman by the name of Bob up there. And whenever we went, we went and saw Bob, and then we go and see Jim. And uh, first time I saw Bob, he was sitting up in a wheelchair and really didn't want to talk much, but we talked a little bit with him. Next time, we could hardly wake him up. There was another time. Yeah, he would acknowledge we were there, but didn't get much. The last time we went, uh, Carl had, he said, I, I talked to his wife, and she, he said, he's, he's pretty bad. We happened, when we got to the door, there is Bob's wife. And Bob's wife says, don't bother even going back to talk to him. He's so out of it, you won't get anything. And Carl says, well, do you mind? We're, we're going to go back and just say hi anyway. And she said, well, do what you want, but you're going to waste your time. We get back there. Bob is laying in his bed, sleeping. And I shook his shoulder. And he started opening his eyes, and Carl says, Hey, Bob, it's Pastor Dan and I. And he started waking up a little bit, and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, had my hand on his shoulder, and said, Bob, do you remember me? I'm Pastor Dan. And he looked right at me, and he said, yeah, yeah. And then he started mumbling something, no one could understand. And Bob said, or Carl said, Bob, I was talking to Betty, your wife. She says, the time is coming. You're going to go home soon. And then he looked at me and he said, yeah, and I don't even know what's going to happen. And I thought, well, we had just been reading N.T. Wright's book on the resurrection. 
<laughs> so I, I said, Bob, do you want the long story? We've just we've been reading a book on this. Do you want the long story? He wasn't in, in the mood for my humor. I said, Bob, you don't know what's going to happen? He says, no. And I says, Bob, we don't know. But here's what we do know. You're going to go and be with God. And that's going to be wonderful. So just trust God. He goes, yeah, yeah. And then Carl said, glad Carl was along. Bob, do you want Holy Communion? Pastor Dan will give you a Holy Communion. And we had Holy Communion. And we stayed awake through it all. And then we said goodbye. A couple days later, he died. In Christ, what John is trying to tell us, in Christ, earth and heaven are coming together and are meshed in one, in Christ, for his people. Amen.
Gracious God, we pray for missionaries and church leaders everywhere. May they encounter the face of Christ and see your hand at work among your people. Help them preach the gospel faithfully and lead a broken world into reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for your creation everywhere for the waters that nourish life, for vegetation that fills the earth, for animals of every shape and every species. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for hurting people everywhere, that they receive hope and healing. We remember especially Pamela Sinquini, Kelly Cowell, Gary Coffey, Nikki Fuller, the family of Cal Fuller, Tiffany Giles, Dustin Jones, Jim Lampy, Pat Morrison, Officer Pearson, Michelle Powell, Jan Snap, Mike Shanks, Louise Snyder, Wayne Sproul, Mary Thomas, Cynthia Tulin, Janice Trotter, and Ed Wood. Are there any others? We pray for these as well as others we name in silence. Keep us faithful to your commandments until we join with all the saints around your heavenly throne. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Jerry Brown and of Dorothy Lokensgaard. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for this worshiping community. Make us faithful companions to those preparing for baptism, for marriage, for participation in Holy Communion. Prepare us to welcome new members, newcomers in our midst. Lord, in your mercy. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, our living water and our merciful guide, you led your people Israel through the desert and provided them water from the rock. 
We praise you for Christ, our rock and our water, who joined us in our desert, pouring out his life for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, life, death, and resurrection, we await your salvation for this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit upon this holy food and on all the baptized gathered for the, this feast. Wash away our sin, that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Today we commune via intinction. You'll receive the bread or a wafer in your hand. Hold on to it until the chalice comes by and dip or intinct it into the chalice, into the wine. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Gracious God, we pray that you accompany us on our journey these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism, that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, pass from self-indulgence, and above all, that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now receive this benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace that sustains every breath we take, the love of God that gives us courage and strength, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that fills our hearts with comfort and peace be with you and all those you care about now and forever. Amen.
My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the 